my dear friends, a couple of things happen in today's readings. And of course you realize that the gospel we read today has been a gospel that has been continuing from last week. And then you can understand the context under which uh, the people are protesting. What are they protesting against? What is it that they're saying is intolerable language that we can't tolerate? What is this? You recall that this is just a continuation of last Sunday's gospel. I remember that last Sunday he told them, guys, friends, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you can't have life in you. You can't have eternal life. And I tell you, it's real flesh of mine and real blood of mine. And, and you can imagine how they feel. How do you tell us to eat your body and drink your blood? This is ridiculous. And so they're coming from that angle. And what is this telling us? What's the message of this? And you realize that in the first reading, we're having a similar reality that Joshua is calling upon his people and saying, you know what? Guy, friends, come here, come here. Okay. What's your position? Why should he ask them what's your position? Do you believe in God anymore? Or you're taking one another direction? And he tells them, by the way, you know what? For me and my household, we'll continue trusting and believing in the Lord. Why should he say that? What prompted him to say that? That reminds you that, of course, things were not easy. Things were tough. And people were feeling this God is not helping us. And that's why they started thinking of other gods. They started thinking, oh, I think we better try this. We better try this. Ah, we've been looking upon you, but God, you're not helping me. You see, where are you? I'm having all this trouble. God, where are you? Ah, you want to continue believing in God and praying? That's your business. For me, I want to go another way. Because things are tough. Things are difficult. And this reminds me of a times what happens really in our day-to-day -day lives. That you see, this often happens that you are helping someone. Helping someone. You help people. You do everything to help them. And say so one day, they need your help whether material, money, or whatever. But this person, you have been helping this family or this friend and this person. But this time, they want your help, and actually, you don't have. And you say, I don't have. I will see if I get, I will give you. But you don't get it, and you don't give them. And you get this person who has not received the help. You come to learn from people that the person has reacted so negatively. He even insulted me. He said, how can this person not help me? This person is so selfish. This person is so terrible. How could you not help me? And he made a lot of negativity about you actually forgetting you have been there for him or her. <laughs> they forget that you have been there for him or her. And if somebody could remember, could hopefully say, ah, today, this time has not helped me. But anyway, he has been there for me. But there are people who will forget that you have been there for them because you have not helped them today. And they say all horrible things about you. And even they may cut communication. You may lose to become friends. And they may even the relatives may no more talk to you. And they say you are horrible, you are tough. Because this time you have not helped them. And they forget all that you have been there for them. And this is what the Lord is telling you and I, that you and I often can relate to God in a similar way. That God has been there for you up to now. And he has been there for you. That you and I today get a problem and forget that God has been there for you. Because today you have a problem, you forget that the God who has been there for you in those other times, in those other difficult times, is there. And therefore, if you can only remember, hopefully, then you can know, you know what? But you have been there for me. You're the one who brought me from that hopelessness. You're the one who has raised me where I am. If it was not you, I would not even maybe go to this job. And if this job is going, you are the one who gave me, then you are there. You can still get me maybe even a better job. You, can, you are there. You are my stronghold. And because you are there, therefore, my reaction 
is different. And the devil so cleverly wants you and I to focus on this problem I'm having now and you forget the great things God has been there for you. You forget. And what do you end up looking for different help? Whom can, who can save me? Whether which doctor or who, whatever you now turn to and you abandon the Lord. Why? Why? And he says that is at the heart of that experience that the true trust is tested. The true truth. You mean you couldn't trust me? You can't remember that I was there for you? Even when you didn't, you didn't even know me? Even you are not there, but I helped you? That you can't even trust that I'll let you through this? And you are surrendering? You are giving up? Because you are saying, Father, Father, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? And so you give up? Because you feel and you see that I've forsaken you. And not until when you see and feel that it's not working. And it's not by imagination. But it's true to your observation and your reality. It's not working. And you're being defeated. And the question is, can you still trust in him and rely on him? And what does that mean? That can I still continue, for example, being kind to you, being patient with you, being charitable with you. When I see this being charitable and patient to you, it's causing me more trouble. That I'm being kind and charitable, but it's causing me more trouble. You're even insulting me and abusing my generosity more and more. Do I continue doing, obeying this call of God, that I should continue being charitable? It can even be that you and I, with our friend, somebody has done such a terrible thing to me. Terrible. And it's not pretense, it's real. It's a real horrible thing someone has done to you. And you are really weeping and bitter and full of anger. And you see a friend of yours that is advising you to forgive. This person has done such a horrible thing to me and you say, forgive. I don't know how you look at me. <laughs> that to a certain point even, we lose friends because you have advised them to be patient, to be merciful, to be charitable, to someone who has been so horrible to them. I said, how can you dare tell me to be welcoming to such a person? That in that point, that bitter word, that word of God, be patient, forgive, have mercy, just help, becomes something very difficult for you and I in certain circumstances to accept that message. And it becomes an eternal, something you can't tolerate. And you and I, me and I, if we are not careful, we will walk away from that invitation to be charitable and merciful and patient with this character that is so terrible and so insulting all my kindness and patience and that you and I find that very difficult to accept and to accept means therefore to follow it to obey, to do it and he says if you and I can remember hopefully that if God would mark my God, but he has done such a terrible thing how can you say forgive them hopefully I can say but Andrew Andrew if God would not mark, if God would mark your guilt, where would you be? If I can only remember that I am what I am because of the mercy of God, that that humbles me to respond to this ugly scenario with a little bit of charity and patience, and that we forget and easily forget how God has been kind and merciful to us, and because we forget. It's very easy for you and I to find it very difficult to be kind and merciful. But if I can remember, like Christ reminded them one day when they wanted to stone this person, I said, anyway, if there's anyone of you who has not seen, let me be the first to throw. When they remembered that they all sinned us, they went away one by one. So we forget, and forgetting becomes a very big challenge that makes it very hard for you and I to be submissive
to the invitation of God, to obey and to accept. What you and I feel doesn't work. In the human judgment, that is testing really your understanding of who God is in relation to you as a person. And that's why the Lord says, I understand. If you don't remember, if you don't accept that I've been there for you, if you don't believe that you are what you are because of me, if you don't believe that it's me who has made what you are, okay, but just trust me. Risk, test, and see the goodness of the Lord. He says, just test and you will see the goodness of the Lord. And that's a really a typical example that Christ no wonder it is. Scripture reminds us and gives us an exception, an example of the experience of what say you guys and you're not accepting this fact and reality that I'm telling you. But what about when you see the mystery of what will happen when I'm going up? What was the meaning? Will you comprehend the logic of God when he's winning by being defeated? When he's winning by being defeated, will you understand that actually he's winning when you can see that he's being defeated? That you can see him crucified, killed, dead, and he's going to save us? And he's winning? Does that add up? And that you start seeing that in the relationship with God, you and I have to learn to trust. Until he said, Father, why have you forsaken me? That that experience happens to you and I. When you feel God is not there for you. But what can take you through to the, to the resurrection is a sense of total trust. Total trust. And deep in your heart, I hope you and I know that God deeply loves us. And God is there for our good. And because he's there for your good and my good, there's no reason to worry and be afraid. And says why that we should learn from him how true love is. And that true love is about what? A total surrender for the other. That is surrendered all for the church. That is surrendered all for us. And the greatest manifestation of that surrender, even the willingness to offer your life for the other. The real manifestation of love. It's when you manifest the highest sense of surrender for the other. And if I surrender my whole life for you, can there be anything that can challenge when I can die for you? And so when it says and puts it so beautifully that you know what, this mystery is difficult in the second reading, but I want to communicate the relationship of God with his Christ with his body, the church. And he puts in an interesting way a reality that invites you and I to think about that he says husbands love your wives. And he says wives submit, surrender to your husbands. I think it's some again mystery that quite often is mistaken. What does love mean? True love means what? We've just seen that true love means me offering myself totally for you. Christ surrendered his life totally for us. There can never be any greater love than to lay your life down for thee. And if I surrender my life for you, the purpose of my existence is for you. And if that is what love is, then what, when he tells the woman to surrender to the man, what is he telling the woman? What is he telling the woman? When is he telling the woman? To love, to love, but using a different eh, expression. To love is to surrender for the other, for the good of the other. And if I said surrender for the man, I'm telling you equally love them. So it's about being there totally surrendering for the other. It's not about superiority. It's about total surrender for each other. And if you can understand what love means and what surrender means, ultimately, then you will appreciate. You can't love me genuinely if you don't surrender totally for me. You don't
you surrender your life for me. What does that mean? You totally exist for my life. You are totally at my service. And there is no that the greatest manifestation of God's surrender and love for us. His love was highly manifested and shown on the cross. When he surrendered his whole life for you and I, while we are still sinners. That he gave it all. And so when God is asking a woman to surrender the life to the, to the man, he's saying, in other words, I hope you understand that surrendering is the true love. And are you man? I hope when you say, say, love your wife, you understand that that means it's a total surrender. That the equation is balanced. That you are totally a gift for each other. You are there to complement each other. But not in the sense of being one is a superior or one is the other. So today we are saying when you and I can remember that and can recollect that it's true surrender and service and our lives can only be manifested in our total surrender to God when we have challenging moments. The challenging moments provide an occasion to testify who God is in my life and the place of God in my life. When I see that it cannot work. Can I still trust and do what he asks me to do? The Lord be with you.